All right. So welcome to, um, I guess, the first episode of Odin in Practice. Um, in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at building graphical user interfaces um, with uh, by, by using Odin, but essentially by using a C++ library called IamGUI. So this library here is what we're going to be using. It's called Dear IM GUI actually. Um, so IM GUI, for those who might not be initiated, uh, is a, let's say, a UI paradigm for how to build UIs. And the idea is that your code is effectively, first of all, one of the kind of cornerstones of it is that your code is simply rendering a state. This renders, uh, quote unquote, every frame, right? Um, usually how these are implemented under the hood, they, absolutely they can be implemented in any which way, but usually how they're implemented is basically we build the UI, this basically puts vertices um, and so on in, well, it builds up a render buffer, right? That render buffer can be shown using almost any rendering library. So one of the neat things about using this is that we basically get uh, we can use this with almost any rendering library or front or back end that we want, right? So let's see if I can find a, a neat example of this, right? Uh, or like a table, perhaps. Let's see. If nothing else, we actually have a table here on this side, I think. Yeah, we have a listing here, right? So we can we can use Vulkan. To draw this stuff, we can use SDL2, OpenGL3, SDL Render2, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, GLFW is used for event handling and so on. Uh, DirectX11, DirectX12, etc., etc. Right. So, with all of this, we basically, first of all, uh, IAM GUI is very common in uh, when you make games and so on um, to use for debug UIs, building tools very easily and so on because it is fundamentally a pretty uh, cheap way, let's say, to build up a UI. So we can see here, for example, uh, we are creating, creating a window. That's this call here, right? And you'll notice there's nothing here about we're creating a class, it has to have handlers or anything like this, right? We're simply saying, hey, here is a window. Here we also have uh, this if I'm GUI begin menu bar, right? And if I'm GUI begin menu, and you can see we're hierarchically building up stuff here, right? This ends here, and we, we we're going to have a color edit here, and so on and so forth. We have inline this samples array, and then we have, we're going to plot these uh, and so on. And these are just float values, of course. Uh, they're using I'm going to get time here in order to be to get this kind of uh, value that changes, changes over time and so on. Uh, and then we have color text, begin child here, uh, which is going to create a, a child window, uh, I think. And then a text inside of there uh, 50 times, right? Uh, with some text. And this is now a scrollable window. You can see here this here, right? And you can see also here, by the way, that we can have color text like this with important stuff and so on and so forth, right? Uh, here you have a color picker. This is actually a uh, already done component, this color edit four, right? So you have this actually because it's a very common thing um, when you, you're you trying to, for example, set the base color for some texture, for whatever, right? Whatever it might be, uh, for some section of UI even, and so on. So I'm going to use this library. Um, all uh, I am GUI libraries, um, which are you know doing things in this kind of way, right? Basically, have the same fundamental shape. So, for example, if you were to look at Rust, uh, you would have eGUI, I think it is called. Right. So here you have this eGUI, which is a, an easy to use, according to them, uh, immediate mode GUI in Rust, and so on. So you can see this has the same kind of quality. We have a heading, we have some kind of horizontal, uh, uh, horizontal kind of grouping um, with, with a label, your name, and then a text edit, and so on and so forth, right? 
So you can see how you build up this UI that sort of responds to changes in values over time. So, um, and I should say, you can, of course, you can make very advanced UIs with this. You can make incredibly interesting things with this, diagnostic tools for things and so on. Uh, and it's fairly easy. Um, it's fairly straightforward to use this um, to a large extent, right? There are downsides to it. Of course, you can see here, nothing here looks quote unquote native, uh, which so people on certain platforms will certainly have a problem with, right? Um, personally, I, I kind of like the IM GUI, let's say aesthetic. So I guess it's not really a problem for me, um, but you know, people may have issues with this. So we are going to use a library by L4, uh, which is a user on the uh, Odin Discord. They've made this library for basically using IM GUI, dear IM GUI, um, from Odin, right? Because of course, uh, dear IM GUI is a C++ library, but there's nothing that says we can't have C bindings to it and then use those, right? So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna install this library, we're gonna go through a small build step, and then we're gonna use it, right? Uh, so let's do that. Uh, let's see what we have to do here, right? The usage here is, okay, we have this build pi file. We have some dependencies that we need. I have already installed this ply here and you, you will need this. Um, and so let's, uh, let's go through this, right? So we're gonna go through the, the process of adding a dependency in Odin again. Uh, I've done this in a previous video, but let's do it here. And so here we're fetching this. Now we have this folder, right? In dependencies, I am GUI. We now have a folder here, right? So let's go into that folder and say um, Python build dot pi. And this is now going to do stuff. And we're going to take a look at the example file while this is doing things. And so we have this I am GUI example here, right? I'm going to copy this. Uh, note here that this is for GLFW, which is the way we're going to uh, set up Windows um, setting up a window, right? And we're also going to be handling events through GLFW and then the rendering layer is OpenGL3 in this case. So we're going to copy this. We're going to change it. It's fine. And so here we're going to see that this is probably going to be done soon. We can wait a little bit. So dear bindings here is a way to generate bindings. Eventually, this will get done. I think. I should have done this, of course, in um, a terminal in NeoVim. We could have already been inside of the files. Now you can see here, it looks like everything went okay. And of course, we're going to go ahead and assume that that's the case. Uh, and we're going to just sort of move right along. So um, now we have this in our dependencies, right? But in order to actually do anything with dependencies in Odin, we're going to have to modify a few places to say that, you know, these dependencies exist and so on. So what we're going to do first is we are going to modify our OLS file, right? And this is just for the editor integration, but it's useful. So here we're going to say uh, name is dependencies. And this is just my uh, way of doing it. Um, path is going to be dependencies like this and what this is doing now uh, is basically it's saying that there is a collection um, and that's a prefix for packages so there's a collection called dependencies that you can find at the path dependencies so we're going to save that we're going to add that there so then, 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 then we also have uh, our task file, right? We don't really have a project yet, but we're gonna just throw together this real quick. Let's see if we can say decompression UI. Uh, let's see. Right, depths, we're gonna say build decompression UI like this. And then we're gonna say CMDs bin decompression UI like this method none because we want to run this always silent true um, 
I suspect that this is all we need. We're going to have to see. And build decompression UI is going to be uh, CMDs. And here's where the collection comes in, right? So here we're going to say old in build decompression UI. This is going to be the folder we're going to use out bin decompression UI dash O speed. Then we're also going to say collection dependencies equals dependencies like this. So this is the same thing as what we did in the OLS file. Um, this is saying that there is a collection called dependencies, which we can find uh, at the path dependencies, right? So we're going to save that. Now we have basically, hang on, we need to do a little bit more sources. Let's see. Um, decompression UI, absolutely, this sounds good. Uh, we actually kind of want to rerun this. Um, yeah, if the LZ4 code changes. Um, also, if dependencies I am GUI changes, let's say. Not entirely sure about this one, but we're going to do that. Just, you know, there's no real problem with adding it, I think. This generates a binary uh, bin decompression UI, absolutely. Uh, silent true and do, 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 do. let's see here. Sources generate silent true. Sounds good, right? Method we don't need to set because we're going to. Yeah, this should be fine. Uh, let's have that there. We're going to add that like this. Let's try running it. It should fail, of course. Yeah, we don't have that folder, so that's fine. Now we're going to add that folder, decompression UI, uh, decompression UI.odin, like this. So this creates a file inside of there. And here we're going to paste what we had, right, from the example. And decompression UI, like this. Uh, fairly certain that's not a problem. It's probably just the parser being a little bit old like right now. Here we actually have to say dependencies. I am GUI like this, right? So what we're actually going to do here is we're going to do that for both of these like this. And now that should be fine. And here's how we actually put a prefix on an import, right? So now all of the I am GUI code is going to be used with I am GUI dot. Uh, and here cannot convert to B32. I think that this is basically this. Absolutely, it looks fine. And da -da 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 -da. we want to set a title here. We're going to say LZ4 decompression UI. The reason I have a <laughs> This very specific title is actually because I run a tiling window manager and that um, I will say does not necessarily always work with some of the features that I want to show in I'm GUI. Specifically, this, um, this feature of viewports enable. So viewports enable um, is going to allow us to actually create multiple windows out of one window just by dragging windows, right? So let's try to build this and run it and so on and see if we have missed something. And here I'm automatically now suspicious because we we're in full screen and we I don't want to be. I, I will show you how this looks when this fails because of a uh, tiling window manager, right? It looks like this, which is not supposed to, um, of course. So we're going to close that and I'm going to quickly check my X monad. Let's see, app in HS, decompress UI. Let's, uh, I'm going to name it. Now, this is annoying me, actually. So let's just say xmonad recompile. And now I'm restarting xmonad live. Um, and now we should be seeing that this 
should work fine. And you can see here that this thing here is now pulled out to here, um, which is a little bit odd. That's because um, I am GUI saves your windows and so on automatically. And so now um, if I want to, opa, yeah, this is uh, getting a little bit tricky here. So what you can do if your iGUI windows have saved some kind of state is we can actually recognize here that there is this iMGUI.ini file and we can actually remove that. So that will allow us to go back to basically whatever the code said, right? So this is how iMGUI looks sort of by default, right? Uh, this is certainly how most people are going to find it um, and so on. And one neat thing about this particular version of iMGUI is that we can dock windows and so on here. Um, Opa, that is now again acting like this. I'm not super sold necessarily always on uh, on this for tiling window managers. Yeah, this is rough. Of course, this is looking very rough. And now this, I have this window here. So in any case, we get tabs, we get this kind of docking uh, behavior and so on. And now I'm actually going to try to just close this and we're gonna rm im gui dot uh, Since I have showed, shown this feature now, I'm going probably to sort of disable for my particular build here, viewports enable, right? So I'm going to comment this out. Um, docking is fine. Um, that's absolutely fine, but this splitting out of, you know, different windows and so on, I don't think work, works very well for a tiling window manager. Um, and apparently it, it could be my compositor or something, right? Uh, certainly on windows, it works absolutely, uh, as far as I've seen, absolutely flawlessly. And I've also tried it a little bit and it, it's been fine. So now I can I can no longer move these windows out, but I can dock them. So here, there was, this will create a new tab. This will just pull it out. Here, it will actually dock it there. If I want to dock it to the side, we can also do this, right? And again, all of this is saved if you want it to be saved and so on. Uh, and yeah, so this is our basic UI. Um, actually, let's go back real quick just to see what is this Dear I Am GUI demo, right? Uh, we can actually see here that there is a window where we have a bunch of stuff. And so this, uh, these are basically uh, a bunch of sort of things we can, it's, it's a demo of all of the things that exist, not all of them, but a lot of the stuff that exists in IMGUI. And this can be good um, to look at if you want, you know, ideas, here's what I can do and so on, right? How do things look and so on? A lot of these are interactive, so you can actually see sort of how this stuff behave uh, and so on. And so on. So there's lots of stuff you can look at here. We're not gonna necessarily look too deep into this. Um, it's nice to have some sense of what's here but at the core of it, we should also be able to kind of build our own things um, and so on. So with that in mind, we are going to go ahead and just say, hey, in the code, we're gonna search for demo and we're gonna see I am I'm GUI show demo window. Uh, and this, we can comment this out, which will allow us to simply not do that, right? So let's say, This is the space we're gonna uh, work in. Actually, let's put that down here. And so here we can actually see that the actual, the actual, actual code in this file for drawing UI is this window containing a quit button, right? So when I've removed the demo code, the only thing we actually have is this, right? And 
what we can do is, we, well, we can start renaming this, we can do whatever we want. Um, and here, let's just show, show sort of kind of how some of this stuff can work with a small, small demo. I'm gonna just make, uh, name this plus or uh, hang on, demo window like this. And this is gonna be plus. And here I wanna say, I am GUI same line. Okay, I'm not getting um, suggestions. I'm going to restart NeoVim here. There you go. So same line uh, and I am GUI text. Let's just say this. And here I have this count variable. And now I'm going to just do kind of the simplest thing I can do here and just say, um, actually we can, we can put, we don't have to have this be a complete global, but it's going to effectively be a global. Um, to be clear, it can basically be up here like this. And when this button is clicked, we don't really want to close the window. We want to say uh, count is going to be plus equal to one. And we are going to put that in there, of course. And so now what we should have is a button that says plus, uh, and then we have a count and so on and so forth, right? Actually, let's do this just a little bit like this. We're going to do minus there. This is going to be minus. Um, same line should go there, presumably. Maybe this. Now we have this demo window here. Here we can plus, here we can minus, and that's it, right? So what you'll note here is that the, the, there was no kind of putting an event handler on something, right? The way this actually works uh, under the hood in many cases is that effectively the code for the button uh, effectively checks, it checks where is the mouse? Is it, a, is it on top of me, right? Am I the current quote unquote hot, um, um, hot component, let's say, right? In this program right now. Uh, and then it checks, is the mouse button currently clicked? And did it start uh, clicking when it was in my bounds? And so on. If that's, if all of that's true, this will return true. And then this will run, of course. Right. So this is how this can work at the very least. I have, I actually don't know how IM GUI does this internally. But basically, if you were to build this, you could be, you could think of it like this: figure out the bounding box for the button, um, draw the render code into a render context, uh, and then say, you know, if the mouse is currently above here and there's no component on top, for example, because you have layers, of course, and it's clicked, and so on, uh, or if it was clicked and released, if it was released during this frame then we would run this code, for example, right? So that's basically what goes into this, right? And then you have kind of non-interactive elements like this line, uh, this text here that really just tries to, it adds to the render context. That's basically what's happening. So uh, in terms of these buttons, that's how, that's why this is an if, for example, right? Because it will return true under certain circumstances where it can determine that we have clicked on it, right? Uh, likewise, hover effect, if we, show this, right? You can see here that it lights up when we hover, right? That is, of course, based on is the am I the element that's currently being uh, is the mouse within my bounding box, right? And is there nothing on top, right? So with that, you basically get this interactivity like this, right? So you don't need any event handlers in reality for any of this, right? And you can see also, in some ways, this kind of resembles um, a game much more than 
a classical kind of UI, right? Where we, we basically just render the current state all the time. Um, in this particular case, it should be 60 times a second. Uh, second, this actually renders um, and so on. But of course, you can also, uh, you can add kind of, let's say safeguards on top of that kind of stuff if you want to. But presumably this is now just doing 60 FPS. Uh, because I have a refresh rate of 60 actually on the screen. Um, okay, let's actually try to add some styling. And I'm not saying, you know, we're going to do some kind of weird CSS stuff. Uh, we're going to make the font size bigger. Uh, I don't, I haven't done this in quite some time. Push font is maybe something we can do push style color that's not really what we want to do push font might be something but i don't know that that's the case i suspect this is not really what we want because we of course want to um we want to create this font thing first. And that is going to be a little bit tricky because we have to basically find a way to load the font. So what is a font actually? If we look at this real quick, we can see some internals. Maybe we have I am GUI load font. Ah, no, no, we saw before. Get font, set font. Is that a thing? No. I am GUI set font size. I really only want to change the size, so we're going to see if we can kind of modify this. Dynamically changing font size. Let's see. Okay, we might have some bad luck here with this particular thing. We might not figure out how to do this at the moment. Because we may or may not have to do much more interesting things in order to do this. And, and dynamically, for example, rendering a texture atlas, atlas for this, a font atlas would be uh, probably a little bit much for this video right now. Uh, certainly. So I, I don't think that we will be doing that right now. Set window font scale might be interesting though. I'm going to say 4.0. We should be seeing a, a remarkable difference with 8. So let's do that and see what happens here. Oh. Yeah, well, this is certainly something. Um, that's an interesting idea. Um, maybe this works per window. In which case, we can try. Maybe, <laughs> maybe eight was a little bit much. Let's say four. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. For for demo. Okay, this is gonna be fine now for demo purposes. I'm gonna go ahead and assume you. Everyone can read this now, right? Um, <laughs> this is. A, well, wow, this is large, but it's fine. We'll get we'll get something out of this for sure. Um, that's neat. Okay, we found the scaling, right? That's that's all we really needed out of this. We're gonna say 1920 times 0, uh, 1080, like this. Now we have a bigger window to play with, and this should be fine. Um, so, okay, let's see here, right? Um, we want actually want a menu first of all and the way you do this uh let's see if we can find our dear friend here 
we're going to say this uh, menu bar here. Um, I also kind of want to I want to maximize this kind of window at the moment, to be honest, right? And uh, I'm going to call this main window like this is no decompression. Let's say this, right? Um, so we're going to say viewport is equal to I am GUI uh, viewport get main viewport like this. This returns a viewport which has a few things on it. Uh, dimensions of the actual viewport is the thing we are interested in. And then we're going to Exactly, we're going to not do pause like this. We're actually going, going to set this to zero, zero. However, uh, we are going to set next uh, window size to the size of the viewport, which is this here. This should basically maximize within our window the actual space we're, we're using for this uh, component or this uh, actual window. Right? Then we're actually going to say no resize. Uh, no collapse and no move I think maybe it is not sure about no move we'll see ah we need the second argument here which is uh, appearing and so just to kind of illustrate what this is we have these cons which is basically uh, how often should this thing happen, the thing you're doing now? You can say that it happens the first time this window shows up. You can say it happens the f every time the window shows up. Uh, it happens always on every frame, I guess. It happens once only uh, and none. None is, of course, like disabling it and so on. So you can programmatically disable these things um, if you want. What we're going to do is appearing. And here in Odin, we can actually just say dot appearing like this. Likewise, we can now say appearing like this now. And that should be fine. We're saving that and then we're running the UI like this. Now you can see that we have one window essentially like this. And here you can actually see that we have a menu bar, but we have nothing in it. And so what I want to do now is add some menu items and so on. And if I remember correctly, this is begin menu, begin menu bar should be the one This returns a bool, um, and so you can see here. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. It's not saying when it's returning a uh, true or false, but usually, when something returns a bool like this, you want to actually say uh, put this in an, in an if, right? So we're gonna do that, um, and here we're gonna actually say end menu bar should be safe in here uh, and here we can actually say I am GUI begin let's see here menu item uh, file is actually the one I wanted we're gonna see here if we can opa if Let's let's do actually uh, let's do fmt printf file clicked just to see that this is actually working as it should. Um, this is undeclared. That's fine. We're gonna put that at the top. By the way, uh, when we said dependencies and so on, this is effectively the same thing as what core is. Core is effectively a collection, right? If you absolutely wanted to, you could. I guess you could create your own core collection uh, and so on. Uh, core is really just a collection that's shipped with Odin. Uh, same as vendor, right? This is also a collection. So FMT here, we're using format. Uh, let's see if we can get this to spit some stuff out. Uh, now when I click file, we are seeing file clicked, right? Now we have some basic menu bar activity uh, or interactivity rather. 
but what we actually want is a menu item inside of this so i think we should be able to let's see this I'm not 100 on this but we should no 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 let's just look this up real quick We have begin menu bar. Menu item, menu item, menu item. That's fine. Let's see here if we can. Oh, of course, begin menu is really what we need here. Ah, okay. I am, I'm mistaken. Let's see here. Let's do begin menu file. Like this, right? Uh, this actually should probably be the change we need, right? Let's see. Opa, assertion window flags in the menu bar failed because we need end menu, presumably. presumably. Now we can actually click open, right? When this closes, when we're done, like this. That's fine. Right, so we have a, okay, we have a menu bar. Um, now, let's add a text field actually, because we want to actually load some kind of LZ4 file, right? Um, let's see here what we can do. We have set the font scale. This is interesting because I, I put that in the middle, but still somehow it applied. I'm not entirely sure how that works. Uh, we're going to remove these buttons and so on. Uh, one of the buttons we can actually keep. Uh, we're going to have a text field here. We're going to keep the same line. And we're going to say I am GUI text or input. Let's see. Input text like this this takes a label and a buffer to put this in a buffer size and some flags so the flags probably we're not gonna necessarily touch right now when does this return true well ta -da -ta -da -ta -da. It doesn't say but i suspect it's when it changes we can check that hypothesis very easily uh, we can actually say input text like this and then we can say let's say um, this is going to be a file name so we're going to say file name buffer like this i think that should be fine uh, the things here we're going to say file name and file name buffer the length is going to be len of file name buffer presumably I, I suspect here we actually have to cast this to a c-string we'll see we'll see uh, the flags we can actually probably pass an empty bit set like this let's save this it should complain now that file name buffer doesn't exist um, let's actually say file name buffer 
256. Um, no, not that necessarily. Uh, file name buffer C string. Let's cast it in line and we'll see what happens, to be honest. And here we might actually have to make this a size. We'll see. Right, that is not possible. Can we do this? No, we cannot. What we can do, however, is file name C string strings. Let's say this for now, and we're going to add strings here. And this is going to be C string something clone to C string, unsafe string to C string. We could also do. I suppose this is possible. Well, C string is really. Actually, don't think that this should be needed. Let's just try this transmute C string file name buffer, right? <laughs> this should be fine. Well, we'll see if it will be fine. It's not really an issue regardless. So now we might see here, right. And so here we can see the if here, when it comes to this file name text field or whatever, right, is basically um, when this um, changes, we're going to get true, right? So here I actually kind of want to have some kind of separation. Maybe we should. I'm GUI step separator, but then same line. I don't know how that works. We'll see. No. If there's a separation here, it's almost non existent. I don't think that there was any difference necessarily from before. We could maybe, I'm GUI, let's see, set so hang on, cursor x is I'm GUI get cursor pos x like this, right? Let's sure 10 is a good test, right? Set it basically a little bit further let's try this right what's the worst that can happen nothing really i don't know if that did anything to be honest x i mean this is the right dimension yeah i'm gonna try y also you kind of never know with this right like this and we're gonna try some more extreme numbers 40 sounds good okay this has definitely moved it a little bit uh, we could of course make this relative also we could check how much space do we have in terms of uh, available space to the right for example right so for example let's say uh, available x I am GUI get 
uh, available content region avail, I suppose. Um, this returns uh, actually, let's say available and uh, available x is going to be available dot x. This is a vec2, but it's their vec2, right? If I remember correctly. Ah, no, it's just a, okay. Dot x actually will work uh, just fine. We actually don't need available x like this in that case, right? Um, let's say that we want to position something in x, right? We don't need our current cursor position even. Maybe. Let's delete this for now. I don't know if content region available returns what you had from the from a given point, right? So it's from now. This should be the case. If I'm reading this correctly, let's comment that out and just say uh, available dot x divided by two. Let's try that. What's the worst that can happen? Okay, so... Right, hang on. This is not quite what I wanted. Let's bring back cursor X again and say that... Right. Now we bas basically said, hey, position this item um, it doesn't look like it's actually getting half of the remaining, to be fair. I'm not sure about this. But regardless, like we've moved it a little bit. Right? So this is kind of how we can do this kind of, hey, we can you know, put stuff in certain places and so on. And of course, you can make basically procedures to do this for you, right? So this set cursor pulse x after a cursor x is really just a matter of you know, packing that up in a procedure if you want to, right? Uh, and then you can actually put place, you know, these components in relative places and so on. So uh, let's print some basic information about the file after we load it. So now we're going to load this file. And what I want to do here is import uh, LC4. We are actually going to just do this. This library should be available here. And when we load this file here, um, Let's see what we can do here. Um, uh, first, we actually want to load the actual file contents, right? So we're actually going to use OS for this. Mm, let's see. We're going to read the entire file for now. Um, it's not really a big deal regardless uh, this takes a name and allocator we don't we're not gonna mess around with the allocator right now uh, file data read success read okay uh, let's just do this actually in fact we can just say okay not really a big deal and here we can say file name buffer but what we actually want to do here is probably just say this and make that a string, probably. This is going to read this. Uh, and then we have, if it's not OK, let's just do nothing for now. Uh, otherwise, we're going to continue and we're going to decompress this data, perhaps. Or we can read the header, um, the descriptor from this instead. We can say uh, descriptor frame descriptor read uh, this will take the file data and nothing more it will return a frame descriptor and the rest of the file right so uh, we have this FD rest and then uh, FD read error like this uh, do nothing for now probably here I actually want to say hey uh, let's say panic F. No, print F is fine. Uh, 
And honestly, why am I even bothering not having anything up here? And here, of course, we can't actually print much. We're just going to say this because this only returns a boolean. We would maybe have to get Erno in order to get something useful out of this. It doesn't matter uh, so much. Uh, it will be obvious why this file read is failing if it, if it is. So a, a reading frame descriptor. Otherwise, we might want to do stuff. And I'm just going to print F this right now so we have something to kind of work with, right? Um, and the rest is not going to matter for now. I'm just going to do this instead. And now when we click load, it should attempt to read whatever the file, what is in the file name buffer. And so this is actually OK. This is a little bit tricky, right? Because this is going to be a. Yeah, OK, we'll see what happens. It's not a big deal regardless. Test data uh, slash. Let's just check real quick. Um, da, da, da. This plain file will do fine. I can't copy this, I guess. Plain zero one dot LC. Dot txt dot lc4 I think it is. So the reason, by the way, I can't copy this is it's in the wrong copy buffer. There are two, and uh, yeah, because one of them doesn't work here. Uh, when I load this, what should happen? Let's bring this up into the foreground. Right. So now we have a frame descriptor. Right. So we've taken the contents of this and actually used it in logic when we click this load button here. Uh, presumably, we can also do this, of course, on enter. Uh, I haven't checked how to do that. Let's actually see how to do that part as well. Uh, and here, I'm going to actually try to control C this and we'll hope that we can use it. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. What can we figure out about the input text here. Presumably, we can actually uh, do this with possibly input text flags. Ah, that's a bit of a stretch, to be honest. I suspect here that we are probably doing something more interesting. So let's see if they have. Uh, input text here, right? So the flags you can see here are often used for you know modifying the text in some way. They're not going to be things necessarily that have, have to do with some kind of handling of anything, right? So you can see password here is something you can use it for, right? So you can just say, hey, this should always be just rendered with uh, asterisks and so on. Enter returns true. Ah, so this is actually what we want. Okay, okay. So here we actually want I'm GUI uh, input text flags flag dot enter returns true. And here we can of course do this, and that should be fine. Let's see how this works. Opa Lanka. That was not the one. Test data. Uh, plain zero one dot txt dot lc four. Enter. 
Right, so this is now only... Uh, right, how do you then deal with this, right? Okay, that's an interesting idea. Enter returns true. Let's see if we can find even more of these interesting flags, right? Input text flags, flag dot, read only password, no undo redo. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Control enter for new line. Well, not, that's not what we want. Enter returns true. If we remove that, what happens then? So if we do this, right, I'm just gonna keep this here for the time being. If we do this and we run, and I were to say, for example, test data um, plane 01.txt.lz4, enter, nothing happens, right? Let's see, what does the internet say? I am GUI, uh, text input, enter. So we could probably read, you know, Let's see if we can find something that kind of more directly handles this. Not that it matters, to be honest, but I am curious now, um, regardless. What are people saying here? So what we could do here, maybe, we could use is key pressed here, maybe, because of course I don't think this is enter thing is actually a thing, uh, but is key pressed. So let's try that, right? Is key pressed. I am GUI key, enter. Presumably this is actually how it's supposed to be. We can see here, enter, indeed. That is what uh, we want it to be. If this is the case, we want to do something, right? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna save this, right? Um, now we can see one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, blah. And then I press enter and nothing happens. But to be fair, that's also because we are not saying enter returns true. And so here I'm editing, 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 edit, editing, and that is not showing me anything though. Ah, okay. Interesting. Right, this was not reacting until I pressed enter. Okay, we can work with this, that's fine. So what we actually wanna do here is actually we wanna say, you know, load file. With file and buffer, I suppose. Let's try that. 
and here I want to you can actually define this wherever you want but I do like having things at the top level um, hmm. here I can kind of want to take a slice to be honest we're gonna take a slice I don't really like this but actually let's take a string we can we can provide a string at some point um, in that case we don't actually need this at all we can just say file name here like this and load file doesn't return anything now because I mean it kind of doesn't necessarily need to here um, we're just playing around so here what we want to do when we press enter here it's interesting that this doesn't re react until you press enter i find that to be a little bit odd if i'm being honest but you know it, it is what it is not a big deal um we are going to say load file with file name buffer here Can we do this? Yes, we can. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a string out of a slice of bytes, right? Uh, that's all I'm actually doing there. Mm, let's see, let's run this and see what happens. And now if I write test data, um, plane 01 txt ld4 enter we can see that we have a frame descriptor down here right and so now we have basically taken this and just said okay I can you know I can type something here we can actually do something based on pressing enter or pressing load here right uh, we actually need to close that file descriptor by the way I should be Where oh, let's close. Ah, no, we don't need to close that, of course, because I used read the entire file from file name and it does all of that stuff for us. It's not a problem. You can see here that it defers a close. So it's not, not a problem. If we open this ourselves and sort of read from the handle and so on, we created the handle and so on, we would have to do all of that stuff. But we don't need to bother with that right now because we're doing this massive read uh, immediately instead, which is fine for now. Um, so now we have this frame descriptor, right? And I want to show this uh, a little bit, right? So we can see that there's stuff in here, right? Uh, there are these, um, you know, there's a version block independence, whether or not, you know, uh, whether it's true. Uh, if it, if we are expecting block checksums, cont content checksums, the actual checksum of the file, uh, header checksum, and so on. By the way, the calculated checksum is effectively an internal field that it's not necessarily internal, but you can use it essentially to check that here's what I think the header checksum is, and that should match what this header checksum is here, because that's read from the file itself. Uh, the block max size, uh, this is good for kind of uh, determining how much do I need to allocate and so on. Um, the content size that is specified and the reason this, this is here is because you can actually specify what is the expected content size of when you extract this. I think that this should just be part of everything, but of course, LC4 is a format that basically is used to build other formats, right? So some amount of flexibility is warranted here, right? The idea here is that the content size is something you can omit if something already knows about it from some other source, for example, right? So of course, when you build a format around this, you could actually get the, the content size that you're expecting from some completely different source and so on. And sometimes we don't even know the content size because it's simply not knowable. You are streaming stuff, you know, constantly um, and so on. So, you know, content size here can be set. Um, Basically, the way my compressor works is that it does set this content size based on the input. It just takes the entire input and says, you know, what's the length of that? 
that's the content size we set and so on. Uh, so for some of these files, it's, it would look slightly differently, right? So what can we ch show from this, right? We are simply going to show probably the version, uh, these Boolean fields, um, the block max size, and so on. And I think that will be it for this video after that. Um, how long have we gone? We have one hour and five minutes. Uh, yeah, let's let's do this. Um, we're going to now return this um, file descriptor, frame descriptor, sorry. Uh, this is going to be LZ4 frame descriptor, like this. Frame descriptor, like this. And of course, you could have uh, errors here. Um, and indeed, we probably would, normally speaking. Um, in fact, no, let's let's leave this for now like this. Uh, not a big deal if we kind of have this be this way right now. I'm going to change these though to error F and so on. Uh, and of course, with the logging functions, you don't need new lines at all. So what we're going to do here is log error F error reading file, log error F error reading frame descriptor like this, right? And what we want here now, of course, is we don't need format anymore. Actually, we can change this to log. And we want to establish a logger uh, in this program. The way we can do this is just set a logger from the beginning. Log create console logger like this. And it's not, it's not going to be harder than that, really. Uh, FMT printf open. Here we can actually say just kind of we can use our newfound, you know, thing here and just say log debug if open like this. And of course, it can be log debug actually, because we don't have any f. In fact, um, not that it matters. You can use debug if not really an issue. So let's just briefly take a look at this now. Uh, and here we should expect, of course, still that we have this plane, 0, 1, txt, lz4, enter. Um, boop, 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 boop. So I can only assume that the logger is not being set correctly. Context.logger equals log.create console logger. This should be fine. Let's try logging something immediately after that. Hello there. Okay, so we can see that we in fact do have these things. So we can see that we're logging errors, right? But of course, <laughs> of course we're not logging our file descriptor anymore. So that's where I that's why I'm not seeing this. If I paid attention to my own code, I would have seen this, of course, but such is life. Um, we have these load file calls here. I'm going, going to say fd is equal to this. Uh, we're going to say that there's a global variable, actually, pseudo global, that is set when you do this, right? like this. Undeclared name fd, that's not really a problem. fd is going to be an lz4 frame descriptor like this this is all zero initialized of course by default so we just have that there now it exists which means we can actually use it to draw things if we want to now we just have to figure out what we what do we want to draw from this right so one kind of easy thing we can do uh, is on the next line because we're you know we're not using the same line anymore here on the next line we could basically say you know render this entire thing uh formatted let's see if we can just toss up a multi line now in input text is not what i want text mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's say multi something else, maybe. I am good. Let's okay. Let's try this, right? 
first we do just the text uh, and here I want opa, here I want just a C string and then args we really kind of want to render the entire C string ourselves so I'm gonna say C string FMT we do need FMT now again uh, T printf FD like this and of course again we do need FMT here right so we can't just take this what we can do in fact is strings dot unsafe to see string or something like this if I'm bear with me here um, unsafe string to see string there you go let's try this the worst that can happen is we get a crash it's fine so here we can see now we're rendering the actual frame descriptor in the program instead right so this is basically like a, a basic check here for you know that stuff um let's try this now test data plane 01 txt lz4 and now of course when i press enter we actually see okay this is the same information we saw before right so we have now done this dynamically just set that variable and of course it's completely just now uh, reflected in this text and of course now we kind of want to turn some of these things into well other elements right because it's not particularly you know this is nice if you you just want to throw up some information you know um, and you can actually do this fairly neatly you can see here we're using both I am GUI and Odin right to just sort of do this here right and by the way I should say here that the percent is of course the normal formatting stuff when I use hash here it actually means pretty print this V right so it figures out how to print the frame descriptor and then it puts new lines where they should be that's why we saw this kind of neat you know indented version right if I instead said uh, without this hash we would see that this will just print straight um, and of course will be a little bit harder to read so we're gonna keep that one there uh, there's no real problem with just keeping that one there so we can sort of see what's going on and now we're going to try to build a little bit of stuff around this right uh, so now I kind of want to say I am GUI begin child frame ish let's see frame descriptor info like this and we have a size uh, the size uh, if we said zeros it's going to grow as much as it can so I'm going to try doing that um, do we have a border I want to see what that looks like so we're going to say true uh, flags window flags don't know really enough about these yet at the moment can't remember them anyway so let's see here uh, if I were to put this text inside of this one, what would we see? We also be, we, uh, need an end child, by the way. Uh, and here we can actually kind of do a defer. Not that it matters, um, but defer should work here. We, we can see. Okay, so we have a border around this area now where we're kind of you know showing this frame descriptor right um, and we could actually say you know if FD version is not zero right and for those who might not know uh, the only legal version of uh, this frame descriptor is uh, one because that's the only thing that the standard actually says right so now we have this 
fast data plane LZ4. And now we actually get this window showing up when we have something, right? So version, uh, we know that zero is an illegal version, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a reliable zero value to use, actually. Uh, I, if you read anything else, there's something wrong, um, in fact. And no parser should actually end up with a version of zero and so on. Uh, and you can have an assert in your LC4 decompressor that says, you know, if I ever, ever read anything other than one, it's obviously BS, right? So let's throw up some checkboxes and stuff, I suppose. I mean, I don't know how we're going to necessarily deal with these, but something like this, right? Uh, let's do this below. Uh, I suspect here I'm GUI. We should have checkboxes for sure. And we can potentially, yeah, let's just throw up check. It, it doesn't matter so much that, you know, um, so actually, let's say text version, and this is FD version. And of course, you can see here with text, uh, we can actually use format strings, and it's fine. Uh, we saw this before with the count. Um, we don't need to use Odin to do these things, right? Um, and here we want I am GUI checkbox probably. Uh, it can be helpful sometimes to say you know FD and then check, you know, okay, so we have the content size, we have dictionary ID, block max size, and so on. And I think that we kind of want to go actually with the definition of the, the actual frame descriptor. And so let me show you that. This actually looks like this. And this is primarily based on uh, how it's laid out in the file. So that's probably what people want to see. I'm going to quickly copy that a little bit here and we're going to say uh, we're going to go down here is that here right now we can actually have much more kind of we can see that oh hang on this is the order and so on that we want to do stuff in and so now you actually get this kind of you know you can kind of just do this as well right and here, I feel like these has doesn't actually make any sense in a GUI because the existence of a checkbox implies a Boolean relationship, right? Um, so calculated checksum we do want as text and header checksum block max size absolutely like this. Dictionary ID really, I don't know if people use that. Uh, so a dictionary ID for those who might not know in an LC4 uh, context is basically, is there some kind of pre-populated or pre-known dictionary that you can use for this, right? So for example, if I'm writing a, I have a compression scheme that uses LC4, um, but I also want to add extra information, I can pre-populate dictionaries with certain values and so on. And what you can do with these is you can say, the dictionary ID you should use for this one is five. And five means something for you. Uh, that means that you can basically say, um, I have dictionary five is Java source files. And in Java source files, we usually see this and this and this and this, right? So we can pre-populate the dictionary with those kinds of identifiers, uh, which means, of course, that we get this kind of, uh, it becomes a little bit more, well, you can, pre-populate with things that you definitely usually see uh, and that way you can, you know, uh, perhaps get better compression and so on. I don't support dictionary these. There's, there's no, at the moment I have no context for why kind of, why I would generalize this uh, to be completely fair or honest. Um, plain 01txt lz4. Uh, and now we have this, right? And so, of course, by the way, I should be clear. Um, the fact that we're doing the scaling is why this looks so pixelated, right? I don't think that in terms of visual fidelity, like um, for text and so on, that I am GUI is going to give the absolute best thing out of the box necessarily. But there are certainly better ways of doing this, right? So if you do scale up a font, by creating a, a texture atlas instead, right? So a font atlas. What this means is basically you're saying, 
for this font size, I want to create basically a texture we can sample from when we render things. Um, and so that gives you a lot better output this way. Here, we're just taking the output we have, which is much, much smaller, and then scaling it up instead three times. This is, of course, going to give us these kinds of results. We're doing this, of course, now because we want to, you know, I want people to be able to see what's on the, <laughs> the screen. Uh, but yeah, so here we can see that we are, in fact, uh, able to output this information like this. And I think we can be pretty sure here that stuff kind of makes sense. There are some small things I want to do. I want this to be an X and we will, we're, we're going to see whether this works in I am GUI. Test data. Yeah, okay, so this works just fine. Um, the reason I want this checksum here, this is because you're often looking for this pattern in files, right? So BD is the, the header checksum that I see in my files, generally speaking, um, because I basically I create them with the LC4 uh, command line tool with BX set. And that means uh, you have block checksums when you have these settings, what you're going to see in the calculated uh, checksum and the header checksum is BD. So we want that to kind of be that way. That's what we're going to be looking for in files. It is one byte, so you can actually recognize BD very clearly uh, and so on. So you really want this to be output, generally speaking, in uh, hexadecimal uh, and so on. Block max size, of course, this is just a number of bytes. Um, and here we have block independence. Uh, block independence means basically can a block, basically are they sharing some kind of compression context, right? Um, I have not implemented uh, block dependence yet, right? They are all independent. If you have a block, it's going to compress on its own, right? Um, I don't know what people usually do with this. Uh, do the blocks have checksums? This means for each data block inside of a LC4 frame, because the frame contains several data blocks. These can have checksums, so you can actually, while you're decompressing, you can say, did this actually decompress correctly? Did I get the correct content? You can checksum that and so on. So it's a very useful thing to have. Same goes for the content checksum. Um, when you've actually uh, decompressed the entire thing, you can check, hey, does this make sense? Actually, the block checksum is, do I have the correct block, period? Um, right from the beginning. And the content checksum is the entire thing for every block. Does that make sense? Right, so we can see, did I get the correct thing? Right? So that's basically per frame. So uh, an LC4 frame, right? So let's remove our debug output there um, just for now. Not just for now. We have the stuff that we need basically here. Uh, FMT is not used anymore. Strings is not used. Okay, that's fine. So let's see our end result. Test data, plain 01 txt lz4. And yeah, uh, I think this is kind of it for now. We did not do the file menu. I will do the file menu, well, either kind of later tonight, honestly or we're going to be doing that tomorrow. Um, I will be working on this series basically continuously every day, presumably. So we should maybe see one or two um, episodes of this even tomorrow, right? Um, but yeah, let's end this one here. We have now basically, let's go over what we've done. Um, we've installed IAM GUI, right? We ran the installation script for IAM GUI, right? And just to remind everyone, the excellent L4 here, right? L4 is the guy, the person that we need to thank for um, providing these things, right? Uh, we then copied the basic example, which is set, setting up a window, et cetera, et cetera. We basically say, hey, here's the UI code we want to modify, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then what we did here, first, 
we just said hey I want stuff in a window so we grabbed the viewport we maximized that viewport here right to fill up the space we added a menu bar and looked briefly at you know how are we interacting in this in this menu bar right we can see you know here that oh uh, we can react to this click on open what we're gonna do there later is we're gonna add a file picker ideally I actually want something like the if people know about the finder uh, file picker let me briefly illustrate what I mean um, it has this neat three kind of uh, structure where um, actually we should add one more of these right? Opa. like this is what we want so you pick a file here that actually shows you here now what so you pick a folder here that shows you the files here and if you pick a folder there you actually show the files in that folder here and so on and this is a, a file picker that I think is really neat so what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to implement that one because I just kind of like it we're gonna do it decidedly let's say let's say in a I am gooey way I, I don't know how to of, of course implement the uh, OS 10 finder file picker or whatever file thingy right so we're, we're not gonna do anything kind of high fidelity with it's not gonna be nice like that one right but we are going to do the version that we can do and it's going to be highly interactive very fast very nice and sort of straight to the point uh, and we're going to try to uh, do colored text based on directories based on files and so on perhaps also show the sizes of some of the files and, and things like this right um, but yeah that, that's going to be the next episode um, in this one we actually took a look at sort of how do we store text how do we react to text changing how do we uh, react to enter being pressed and so on and we saw out here that uh, we can react to changes on enter like here right and then we can actually say when the enter key is actually pressed here we react uh, we saw that that was a little bit funky with the behavior where what we're actually doing uh, what we end up with is um, we are only reacting now when enter is pressed whereas before we were reacting on every key press and so on so that can be a little bit um, funky perhaps right uh, we might want to take a look at some alternative ways of doing that right and of course I am GUI is structured in such a way where we can actually kind of make our own things fairly easily and we will probably in the future we saw here how to use same line in order to say hey I have some kind of component here right that basically I want to put something next to it normally speaking if we don't use same line we're gonna actually put things below right uh, so same line here basically says put this load button on the same line right we saw here also that we can get the available uh, content um, the the available space that we have from a certain position right and we saw here that we can use that with the, our current position to just say hey place this some amount to the right for example right and so on um, so then we also have this basic idiom of if if something right and the way this works under the hood for this button for example uh, is that I am GUI basically checks um, are we hovering over the button have we clicked and when we clicked was the hot item the button and have we released that will basically determine if this is true and that will be this button is clicked and that idiom follows through on many many of these things where uh, we have clicked on this button so we're going to execute this thing here which sets our variable FD which was of course the frame descriptor right I should probably change uh, FD here to be frame descriptor and here we don't need to change it it's a very small scope it doesn't matter and here we're gonna delete this uh, and so apart from that we also saw that we can conditionally render items by just 
well, saying, you know, if this is true, we want to do this. If it's not true, we want to do that, right? So what we actually saw here um, is that I can say, you know, if we don't have a version, right, if, if the version is zero, right, we actually just want to, um, we want to do nothing here. What I could have done, presumably, is actually say, hey, if this is equal to an empty frame descriptor, let's see, for frame descriptor like this, that might also work. Um, this is not what I wanted. So let's say this. Yeah, I could do this because frame descriptor does not contain anything that is not comparable. But if it did, uh, let's say there was, for example, a slice here, we would not be able to compare this. So this is not necessarily a great way to compare things always, right? Uh, what you could do instead is have a field that tells you, hey, this is populated, right? The, the data inside of this thing might suck, but it is populated, right? So for example, you would have uh, has stuff in it or initialized bool, right? That could be a thing you could do, for example, right? Um, but you can also do this when something is comparable and it's comparable if it's a basic type, basically, right? But once you start getting slices and things, it, it doesn't know how to compare anything. The absolute best way, because we know the context here is actually to say frame descriptor uh, version is not zero, right? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Actually, let's delete that. There you go. Or if it is, yeah, it's not zero. Actually, we could, because we know this particular context, we could say this also. Because the frame descriptor version has to be one. Uh, that's the only version that exists. So uh, we can conditionally render stuff. We can also, we saw here that we can use defer when we want to end the child inside of a scope like this, right? Um, and this means that we can basically put that code there and just add whatever we want below it. It will execute just fine because defer runs, of course, a function at the end of it of the scope, right? And that's completely fine to do here, right? Uh, in this particular case. So I think that's it uh, for the kind of walkthrough of what we did and so on. Um, again, there will be very soon a, a video where we, we try to do more with the file picking uh, and so on. We're going to try to make a snazzy file picker of some sort, probably. Um, I feel like I'm promising too much right now, but yeah. In any case, um, that's the plan. We're going to continue on with this. We are also going to add, basically, when we have loaded this frame descriptor, we actually have to load data. That data resides after the frame descriptor, so we're going to parse that into um, frame blocks. Um, those frame blocks themselves have sequences inside of them that tell us if we need to copy some literal content or uh, content that was already present in the file. That is how this works. We're going to go over those things uh, in a later video where we actually build that and visualize that um, and so on. The people who watch that video are probably going to learn how LC4 works to a large degree, but we're also going to do a follow-up video where we actually use that in order to explain LC4, Com compression, decompression. Um, but in this process, we're simply building the tool and it's merely kind of by accident and sort of exposure that we're gonna learn how LC4 works uh, and so on. So that's it for today or for this video and uh, have a nice day and ciao.